Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Wadsworth for posterity. I'm Cesar Carino, your host, and our guest today is Kenny Durr. Kenny, I guess officially we call you Kenneth, but I've never called you Kenneth no. in my life, so I'm going to keep on calling <laughs> right. you Kenny if you don't mind. Right. Kenny, you um, uh, probably fit into one of those categories that a few other of our other uh, presenters uh, have fit into, and that is that um, when we interviewed um, um, Dana Kreider, we, told, we said that he had the largest lawn in Wadsworth because uh, Dana probably has planted every lawn in Wadsworth, or hundreds of them. And when we interviewed um, Jim Morrison, that we said that uh, we had the greatest number of the, the largest topography because he probably has surveyed that. Uh, with you, we probably are going to say that you have the largest building in Wadsworth because you probably have designed dozens of the buildings in Wadsworth, including this school with the, where, where we are presently, and uh, a lot of other ones. And we're going to be talking about that in a minute. But first of all, we have to find out who Kenny Durr is and where he came from, who his parents were, and all of that. So if you're not sensitive about your age, when were you born, Kenny? 1923. 1923. So that makes you 74 years old, right? right. And you're still working, and you still right. look great. Well, and, sort of. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Where were you born, Kenny? Uh, Akron, Ohio. Where? Who were your parents? Uh, my parents were uh, Dr. Dwight uh, Durr and Hazel Durr Boyce. Um, and we lived... Uh, Dr. Durr was a dentist. Your right, father was a dentist. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, we lived over in the West Akron near Walhaven and uh, that area. I went to uh, Fairlawn Grade School. Uh, it was a first class in that building when it was first built. Uh, and then, uh, about 1938, Dad bought a farm in Bath on Hametown Road. Uh, so I went to Bath High School uh, four years. I think there were 16 in my class. And uh, uh, after high school, I went one year I graduated in 42, and one year to Fenn College, which is now Cleveland State. Cleveland State, that was in Cleveland. And then in, uh, went to, in service uh, for two years. Uh, and when I got out of service, uh, uh, I decided to uh, go into architecture and worked one summer for a firm in Cleveland and one of those members of the firm uh, had been a uh, Michigan graduate University, so, University, University of Michigan, Michigan right and he wrote a very flowerly flower letter to the Dean up there and he suggesting that uh, I'd be accepted there, and it was before the, because I was discharged uh, uh, in 45 before the war was over. I, had a, uh, I was on limited service, and, and so I got out a little early. So I got into school before that the big influx, of influx came, and so that's how I happened to end up up there and uh, graduated in January of 1950 and moved to Wadsworth. What brought you to Wadsworth, Kenny? Well, of course, the family has been here for many years. Which family? Generation, the Durr family and the Boyce family, my mother's okay. family, and they're both from up around Benita, uh, southwest. Uh, Boyce is B-O-I-S-E. Right. And Durr, D-E-R-R. -R. We need to spell everything so that 50 years from now, when, <laughs> excuse me, when we're no longer right. around, we'll have uh, the correct spelling. Now, one of the um, uh, reasons that we wanted to have you come in, of course, is for your architectural background and tell us about the buildings that you have designed here in Wadsworth. 
But the other reason is that um, outside of the fact that your father moved away from here, you know, to <coughs> practice no. medicine in, or dentistry okay. in, um, in Akron, uh, you go back, what, three or four generations, maybe 150 years or so in the, in the area. Is that correct? Right. My great-grandfather, um, whose name was Jacob Durr, uh, is buried down here, and he died in... Uh, 1886, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, then um, he had, and then we have run a fairly complete genealogy. My dad and uncle did it in 1960, and then my brothers brought it up to date, and uh, clear back to the German Huguenot uh, uh, movement. movement. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> there's another famous Durr in Wadsworth. Who was that? Well, my aunt was pretty well known here, and Jake Durr was uh, quite a person that uh, had a history here in Wadsworth. We had a mayor, we Durr. Had, uh, who was he? Well, that was my grandfather. Grandfather. Jake. Okay, Jacob Durr was a, was a mayor of Wadsworth. Right. And do you remember when he was mayor? Around 1931 or 32, I think that it was when the city, or when uh, Water from village, first became a city. Was from, from, yeah. from the time that it was a village right. to a city, right. right? From the center to the right. city. Uh, was the center at the right. time it was called, and that was that 1931, I believe. In 1932, he became the mayor. Right. And he was a mayor for, what, two terms? I really don't mm -hmm. remember. Uh, Either one or two terms. So your grandfather was the mayor of Wadsworth. Right. Right. Do you remember him at all? Oh, yes. And what was it like when he was mayor of Wadsworth? Well, he and Tommy Lucas sort of ran the town, as I remember. Tommy was a police chief and had a motorcycle and... Uh, um, kind of a marshal, wasn't he? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I can remember a few instances. I remember some of the things when he was... Uh, down to DH and L, uh, that was the D was for the Durr, Harrison, and Lesher. Uh, and I can remember as a kid playing on the feed bags down right. there. Now the DH and L was a feed store, which is in the south part of Wadsworth, right. and it's on somewhat on the corner of Main Street and State Street. Right. But it's not the first building; it's the second right. building down there. And your grandfather was the Durr of Durr, Lesher, and or, uh, Durr, the Durr, Harrison. Harrison and Lesher. Right. And who were Harrison and Lesher? Well, Harrison was a woman, and she was a bookkeeper. That's right. And Lesher, uh, I think it was Ike Lesher, uh, and they lived across the street from on Baldwin. Baldwin Street. Right. And... Uh, that was, I think they bought that or took over that. It was a, it had been a feed store, and a, a Dutt, I believe, was the uh, uh, owner of it before Grandpa. Now, Grandpa, Grandpa Durr purchased this in about 19, what, 20? I think around 1918 oh, or, 1918? or someplace in that. Uh, uh, era, maybe a little. I know that later. my family has been a continual customer of D.H. Nell since 1926, <laughs> which is okay. 71 years. And um, the irony of it was that oh, maybe four or five or six years ago, they were changing over to a different kind of accounting system. And when I went down there and I uh, was getting some uh, gravel, uh, like a truckload or yeah. something like that, and uh, called it in. And the secretary, or the person who answered yeah. the telephone, said, um, uh, "Sir, uh, we have to have cash. Excuse me, we have to have cash for that um, because we don't have a credit rating on you." And I said, "Well, uh, that's fine. There's no problem. But um, do you want me to come in to give it to you? Yes, we ha we'll have to have that. Uh, just give it to the driver. But if you would like to have a credit rating, uh, we'll be glad to um, to do that as well." So I said, "Okay, fine. So that I can, you know, go in right. there and charge things and don't have to right. like call on the telephone and all that." So she said, "Would you give um, give us three references?" I said, "Yes, D, H, and L." <laughs> and she was taken aback because we had. 
purchased things there from 1926 on. Right. This would have been 50 yeah. years later. So when I mentioned it to her, then she kind of chuckled, and of course then she turned it over to somebody else whom I knew, and uh, there was no problem. Right. But I thought that that was kind of an ironic <laughs> thing that the D.H. Nell, so your grandfather, Jake, was a D.H. Nell person with um, um, uh, uh, Durr, Harrison, and Lesher. Right. He was the mayor of Wadsworth. And um, how did Glenna Durr Lobenthal come into the picture? Well, Glenna was the youngest child of uh, Jake, Jake and Jake. Cora. Right, Jake and Cora. And uh, uh, so she... Uh, so she was Aunt Glenna aunt, to you. Right, and taught school here for many, many oh, years. Oh, yes, and know. everyone loved her. Every, right. uh, we have had maybe no fewer than a dozen people mentioning uh, Glenna. Uh, Dur Lobenthal, yeah. she was uh, yeah. she was a legend. Right. Uh, very effusive, uh, warm, compassionate, right. good teacher. Yeah. Um, never had to to discipline because she just was so interesting right. that people would just follow her everywhere around. Now then, we probably skipped over some very important aspects of your life here, uh, Kenny. Uh, how about brothers and sisters? Well, I have two younger brothers, um, Paul. Uh, is about four years younger than I am, and Tom is uh, six years younger. What do they do and where are they? Well, Paul uh, has been in the retail sales business all of his life. He started out at, after high school with O'Neill's, uh, uh, became in the soft goods, um, uh, fabrics, and this Dry type goods of thing. and things right, of that dry nature. Goods, right. Mm -hmm. And then he went to Erie, Pennsylvania with Trask Department Store as a buyer. And I guess the snow got to him up there in Erie because he said he never could see the ground from about the first of November to March. And March or April, probably. So he moved to Florida. And started so a lot of ground then. <laughs> right. Started a interior decorating business at Punta Gorda with uh, another fellow that he knew up there. He was involved with the Chamber of Commerce at Punta Gorda in Charlotte County. And then he went with Sears and uh, had many positions and moved all over the South uh, uh, as department and heads and store managers and, and in all uh, types of positions Surely. and uh, ended up, uh, uh, I don't know how many, they moved, I think about every two years they'd move them into a different city. And uh, he ended up in, uh, out near Oakland, California before he retired, and then he moved back to Florida and is living in Valrico, Florida. Tom, uh, Paul didn't, uh, he went one year to Ohio Northern, I believe. Tom uh, uh, was a football player at Bath and uh, then went to Case uh, in engineering went to service for a while and um, came out and finished his engineering degree in civil engineering at Case. I'm not sure that he wasn't in the same, about the same class as Jim Morrison because they knew each other. And Wadsworth. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Tom's been in highway work. Uh, he was with uh, Dalton and Dalton in Akron for quite a while and then um, the highway work sort of dried up at one point and uh, he went to Florida and has been doing highway work down there. Down and he's Florida. Still, right, and he's still, they both live in the same town. Paul, or Tom works in uh, Tampa uh, area for several different engineering firms and so forth. But he lived in Wadsworth uh, when he was with Dalton and stuff. On, and, uh, so, uh, Paul's have uh, 
two boys and a girl, and Tom has to, uh, let's see, one girl and a boy with his first marriage, and one boy after that. Uh, I see. Now, what about the other important aspect of your family, your wife? Well, wife uh, came from Bath. Uh, we went together in high school and uh, taught school. Uh, well, she started teaching just before we got married in 47 in uh, um, Greensburg. And her first job is music teacher. She's uh, it's always been in music involved. Uh, was right. It was either eleven or twelve hundred dollars a year. I'm surprised it was that much. You know. <laughs> and then we were married. She moved. We moved to Michigan, and she had all the music uh, in the whole school. It was twelve grades in one building, and everything from and all plus another class of history or something, uh, uh, but she got a $200 raise when we went to Michigan. She, I think she made twelve dollars or $1,300 a year. Big money at that time. Right. Big <laughs> you money know, in the 40s. Well, I was going to school. Why, of course. And uh, then when we moved back here, um, she taught music here in Wadsworth. Uh, How long did she teach in Wadsworth? Well, I know she had about 28 years credit to her to retirement. Now, part of that was the time she taught in Michigan, and um, um, she worked the post office. She got credit for that. Sure, so I, I suppose she's at least 25, 25 years. 25 years, and um, her name is what? Lois. Lois. Lois Durr. Right. And she has been a Wadsworth teacher, and everyone right. knows her. Right. And right. She's influenced a lot of the kids in right. Wadsworth. Tell us a little bit now about um, uh, your... Uh, the beginning days of your architectural prowess here in Wadsworth. What was the first job that you had? Well, uh, I started out, we, uh, one reason we moved to Wadsworth, my grandfather Boyce had bought three houses here in, in town. He was, had been a farmer all his life uh, on Benita Road up uh, just north of Fixler. And um, one of those houses became available, and housing was kind of tough in that time. And so we moved into a six-room house across from the power plant on Broad Street. And uh, I set up... Uh, words, uh, so we have this for historical evidence. That's uh, two houses up from Fairlawn Avenue on Broad Street, right? Two or it three. It was next to the old Coleman Right, okay, home. that'd be three houses up there. And... Uh, uh, Bernard, Bernard Coleman had the house was kind of on the hill right, there. Right, right. And we were next to it. Next and door. Next, and Bill Hartman lived next door. Right. So I started an office in a bedroom upstairs and doing, and I'd work, I was working part time for another firm to get till I got enough that I could uh, make, your make own. Uh, grocery money and so forth. One of the first uh, Contacts was with Earl Alvey, uh, the old H and H construction. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, as I remember, um, Holmesbrook supply or lumber, lumber was down on Watrusa, where that's right, where the, the old restaurant is now. Right. Mm -hmm. And we put an addition on that with Earl to the south. Right. You're right. Uh, well, it was south and east, the east south and, and east, the right. end of it, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so I became quite good friends with Earl. I had a lot of respect for him, and he was, uh, uh, and so I did a lot of work to start with with them, and some residential uh, things and little things until uh, I kind of. Then I moved. I was only there at the house probably, oh, a year. Uh, I didn't get my license, architectural registration, until 51. 
So I really couldn't practice right. on my you own. You had to have somebody else 52. sign your. Right. And who uh, did you? Whom did you get to sign your um, your your drawings? Well, I really didn't do anything on my own from fifty to. 51. Oh, you did not at all? No. Some, some I was working for that. another firm. I worked for, well, while I was in school in summers, uh, Boyd Huff. And Huff did school work all over Summit oh, County sure and money. And, 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 uh, and I think one of the jobs, two of the jobs I remember working uh, on when I was working with Huff was uh, Overlook School in the addition to the Wadsworth Hospital. Right, and this was the maternity addition to the old hospital, right? Right. The one that goes to the northeast, right. the northwest rather. Right. Now, uh, Overlook School would have been what year? Well, it was in the, probably 50, Two or three, or something or four, in that area. Now, 54. Something. What was there at Overlook School before you started breaking ground for Overlook? I don't remember. I didn't, um, the Keller Farm was there. Yeah. Did you remember anything about the Keller Farm? Did you no, have No, I, I was, um, you know, we just, we had the jobs in the office and we really never got out on never the Never got site. out on the, on right. the job, right. I see. So then Overlook School was probably the first thing that you did in Wadsworth. Well, yes, under Boyd under Huff. Boyd Huff, right. um, and, uh, Boyd Huff is, not, is right. an architectural right. firm from Akron. Right, right. And you worked for them. Right. Then, do you remember any other buildings that you worked with uh, in Wadsworth? Well, um, not with him, but uh, in the late 50s, I started doing some work for the schools. Wadsworth uh, schools. Wadsworth schools. Um, and I don't remember the first one because we, I think we worked on every, I have worked on every school except Overlook. Uh, either put additions on or boilers. We did major addition to Valley View and then but we did school work uh, for about 25 years, all the Wadsworth schools, mm -hmm. and some of them are uh, pretty small things, bus garages and boilers replacements and window replacements. And, and then uh, uh, at the high school, um, all the vocational facilities, uh, Business office education, the library, the science wing. Uh, that was all added on later. Right. That was to the east of the the, the original building. Right. And uh, probably the most noteworthy is the gymnasium building that uh, we did, and I can't remember I, uh, when that was. The new gymnasium. The second right. gymnasium. Right. right. Now, Kenny, do you remember what the plan for that school was when it was first built? What was the architectural plan? Of the high school here? Right. Well, um, it was a campus plan. Tell us what a campus plan is. Well, it had individual buildings connected by outside corridors. And when you say outside quarters, you were talking about outside quarters. Right. Just and the plan was probably made on a hot day in July, is that correct? Right. <laughs> it had been a great deal for Florida, but uh, not too great here. How did we get involved with that plan? How, who, uh, who talked us into that? Well, the architect was from Newark. Um, Baker, I think was his name. And uh, he was doing that style of buildings all over the state. And they're very inexpensive. As I recall, the original building uh, was built for around $10 a square foot. That is cheap. It, and it was, it was his style of, of building was very inexpensive. It had an awful lot of glass in it <clears throat> and uh, exposed structure and so forth. And uh, it wasn't too long before we started 
closing things in. The, there was a one major advantage to that style or that campus plan is that you could add on to any department because each one was a separate building where if it had all been in one compact building, it would have been very difficult mm -hmm. to add science wings or vocational well, I'm sure that there are a lot of, um, you know, yeah. a lot of advantages, right. but the right. disadvantages outweighed the advantages, did well, they not? Tell us about the, um, um, all, all the machinations that were involved with, as you say, covering the walkways. How did that work out? Well, the first additions were just added on to the sides of the various buildings. And then, uh, and when we did that, sometimes we closed the corridors in because they became part of the addition. And then we had uh, probably the, the most significant enclosure was when we put uh, the walls around the courtyard out there to make them at least protected from, because it was a problem getting snow removal in there, into the courtyards and so forth to keep them clean. And the kids had to go outside to go from one class to another. And uh, uh, it just was, and the heating on the thing was horrendous. Had you, had you um, begun work on that from its inception, would you have recommended this kind of uh, plan? No, I don't think, no, I think so. so. Um, I, it was very difficult for a lot of people to understand how they were going to do this. Uh, it was a nice place, a nice looking place. Right. You know, it was very nice, right. all that campus and a lot of green area and all of that, but right. um, we certainly didn't have um, the kinds of winters in Ohio right. that uh, would right. uh, constitute uh, good enough reason to, to do that. Uh, Kenny, as you look at the Wadsworth High School today, uh, tell us what kinds of things you were involved with in making the changes and um, tell us why you made those changes architecturally. I'll give you a couple of clues. The roof. <laughs> well, uh, they've had a lot of roof problems and everybody in town knows that. Now, uh, and I kind of guess got a bad rap on some of those, but the bulk of them were in the original building. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in trying to match roof lines in the architecture, we more or less had to follow the same roof lines and structural system, basically, that was here in order to, to make it match. Um, all the roofs that we put on, uh, were at that point in time sort of state-of-the-art roofing materials and technique and so forth. And they were all bonded under a 20-year warranty bonds on the roof. Um, but uh, roofs are, are a um, yeah. element of a building that is uh, uh, has gone through many changes in Indeed my... Indeed they have. Um, there are two little stories that I'd like to tell. We had Ralph Rohr here the other day, who was 88 years old and who um, started the Diversified Occupations mm -hmm. in Wadsworth and also was um, the um, one of the progenitors of industrial, rather of um, um, vocational. vocational education in Wadsworth. And he tells the story about Frank Close, who was extremely tight with the money. Um, one day, Ralph Rohr was coming into the building, and he noticed that the, the trap door to the roof was open. And he thought uh, an errant student was up there, so he kind of waited. And pretty soon, this person came down there, and he looked like a bum. He had all old, old clothes, and it was all tarred up and so forth. And uh, lo and behold, it was Frank Close, the superintendent. And Ralph said, uh, Frank, what on earth are you doing up, up there on top of the roof? He said, well, there's a leak. And the best way to fix a leak on a roof is with gunny sacks and tar. And he said, that works. And Ralph said, I don't know if this was true or not, that was probably, oh, 50 years ago. Ralph said, um, 
And it did hold until this past August. And of Is course, that that's, right? when we had, <laughs> that's when we had the, um, uh, the tornado that ripped the roof right. off the, what is yeah. now the junior right. high school, right. but it was the high school right. at that time. The other story that I like to tell about roofs is that my father would build small buildings on our property, and since he was not an architect and did not know about flat roofs, he always made pointed right. roofs. Right. Isn't it strange that poor guy didn't know about flat roofs? But why do we make flat roofs in this part of the country? Well, uh, Water goes downhill, snow uh, goes downhill, yeah. why do we make them flat? Well, I think um, tar uh, was probably one of the first Roofing materials, you know, that goes back hundreds of years. And then you have industrial buildings that cover acres of ground. And to try to put a sloping roof on a building that, you know, is 100,000 square feet would be a very difficult job. And then you have um, um, uh, fire ratings, which means you have to have non-combustible construction, and trying to do that in steel um, or concrete or some other material uh, would have been very costly and, and problems of... And that's why they have the flat right, roofs. Right. I see. Okay, that and, makes some sense. Yeah. And, uh, but over my period of time, I've seen all these different roof materials for flat roofs and slope roofs. Some of them, you know, and they hit the market and they're going to solve all the roof problems and they last about five years and they uh, have problems and we're, and we're going through it even today with the rubber roofs. Now those rubber roofs are just one piece of rubber, is that right? Or Some of them are, yeah. Uh, very expensive. Not usually, they're they're in large sheets, but you know, when you have a hundred foot square building, you have to seam them someplace or join them together and around the walls. And they're going to they're going to solve all the problems, right? But they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> huh? What happened? Well, um, uh, the joints came through. The first ones that. Uh, were held down with stone. You put four inches of gravel on top of them to keep them blowing off because they didn't, the, the normal adhesives of tar wouldn't stick to the neoprene or the rubber type roofing. So they had to be mechanically held down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and the, the biggest problem we've always had with roofs is not the materials, but the people that put it down. Uh huh. And in uh, uh, the supervision of, <coughs> of putting roofs down, and that is where most of our problems have always come from. It isn't actually a material failure, <coughs> but the workmanship failure. What are the kinds of buildings have you done in Wadsworth now, and uh, since your your beginning here? Well, um, early, well, most architects start in residential. Residential. Uh, and they Do get, you have any houses in Wadsworth which are significant that you well, did? Well, yeah, I have some. We did, uh, I think, uh, I sort of made a list. That's uh, fine. Why don't you just read uh, from the list? That's perfectly well, all right. Well, uh, I count up 13... Um, homes that um, you know I felt uh, proud Pretty significant. Of ERA. And who, what, which and, homes are uh, those? Well, um, uh, Howard Young, um, uh, Bill Everhard's up on Good Street, um, Walter Clark, um, um, oh, let's see. Wen Shoes. Uh, Walt Wen Shoes. Jack Summers. Jack Summers. Uh, Henry LeBose. Henry LeBose. Uh, um, Staten's office and house. Um, and uh, then there was a lot of other 
just but those architecturally I think had more significant had more significance right, than some of the right. other ones. What but about there was thirteen or fourteen? Thirteen or fourteen, fourteen. Of them, that, and that's a significant amount. What about the uh, industrial buildings that you've done besides schools? Well, um, uh, when Merle Weber was active here, we did a lot of uh, Admiral Machine, um, uh, Delta Plastics, which is on Seville and the Spill railroad road, track. Right. Uh, I can't, I'm trying to think of the name of the people that are in there now. Um, and um, Barefoot Soul probably was the most significant. We did a lot of factory additions there plus their office building. And uh, uh, so that kept us uh, busy and uh, working with I.B. and Tim Calvin. Um, so... That won an award, I believe, it did it not? I don't know. It... Uh, the brick? It was... Uh, right. I think it did. The brick won an award. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And you chose the brick, right. did you? Or did right. the, either you or Pat Brannigan chose the brick? brick. Well, Maybe in Tim Calvin uh, and I worked together on designing and planning this building and the office primarily. And uh, I'll never forget the uh, day we took it in to show these preliminary plans to IB. Tim's father, who was one of the old hard industrialists that came up and uh, IB said, uh, and we had a nice corner office up in this new office building for him. And he said, well, you're not going to put me up in any ivory tower. He said, I want my office down the middle of that factory where my money's being spent. <laughs> and, uh, um, and that's exactly but, what I.B. Uh, Calvin was, too. Right. Oh, he was, I got along beautifully with him. I had, uh, and he liked me, and we got along fine. But uh, uh, he had two, two things that would send him right up through the roof, and one was uh, labor unions and taxes. Those I mean, two would send him to the well, roof. Oh, he, you know, and... Uh, he has a, had a, a rather a volatile personality, right, too, didn't he? Right, right, right. But uh, uh, that was, we did probably more, um, and that was fairly heavy because it was two stories and they had Banbury, um, in there to mix rubber and uh, tow motors and and things. So um, that was a that was a nice experience. Uh, uh, and Tim was very open-minded in design and materials and quite knowledgeable. He would read about mm -hmm. things. And, he knew all and, about that. Right, and he was willing to take um, do some experimenting uh, with some new ideas and so forth. So now you've done some houses, you've done some schools, you've done some factories. What about churches? Do you have any churches to your name? Well, we've worked on, uh, I'm not sure we've done any complete churches here. We've put additions on to um, oh, the Christian Missionary Alliance Church up uh, and uh, Humboldt, Humboldt and Boyer. Right? And um, uh, let's see, I've done a lot of churches in other areas in Akron and Smithville and Wayne County and down in that area. Who works with you? Who are some of the people, who are some of the, uh, the architects and office personnel who work with you? Well, um, after I left the bedroom here in Wadsworth, I moved to Akron. Uh, and took on, not as a partner, but just, uh, we found an office in um, uh, downtown Akron, uh, and we shared the rent, and he did his work and I did mine. And then uh, we moved over on- Who was that partner? Uh, John McKenzie. John McKenzie. Yeah, we really had no, um, a partnership. I mean, we didn't share 
finances or jobs or anything else. Uh, once in a while, we'd work on each other's if we got in a jam. And uh, then I moved over on West Exchange Street near um, uh, Akron General Hospital. And I then I brought a draftsman that had been with Boyd Huff, uh, Ray Stuber, came with me in the um, early 50s. And we were there for uh, oh, a couple years. And then we moved out to Fairlawn on Frank Boulevard off of uh, West Market Street. Um, and we were there for quite a while. And Ray was, uh, we worked together and we had some draftsmen. Um, and uh, in 1961, I believe it was, we bought an architect's office in Kent, in Kent uh, Kistler's. We were looking for some draftsmen and we went over to see if his, he was elderly and retiring. And so he said, why don't you just take my whole mm -hmm. office and I'll sell you the stuff for just for the furniture it's in it. And so we opened an office in Kent and Ray uh, ran that. Um, and we did a lot of work in Portage County. Um, and um, then I had taken in another draftsman, uh, Marine Canarcion, um, and he became a partner. So it was, first it was Durham Stuber, then it was Durham Stuber and Canarcion, and then we took in another architect in the Kent office. His name was um, uh, Brown. So at one point it was Durr, Stuber, Canarcion, and Brown. It's a long word. Right, well, and then the Kent office finally split off um, and we left uh, Stuber and Brown run that and Canarcion and I had the Akron office. Then we moved from Frank Boulevard over on Jacoby Road and Copley Road into um, what was the old Sparkle Market over there. And um, it was vacant and we made it into office space and moved our office there and was there clear up until the time that I moved to Wadsworth. Back to home, back, back to, to Wadsworth. <clears throat> and where's your office now in Wadsworth, uh, Kenny? It's in the old Conval office building. The Conval office building on the upper floor on the northwest corner, right? North, right. Yeah, northwest yeah, corner. Right. And who was working with you? Well, there wasn't anybody then. Uh, uh, when I decided to move to back to Wadsworth, um, I talked to Tom Fixler, and he says, well, why don't you come down to the Conval building? And uh, just because up to that point, it had been vacant. After Conval left, it was in. So, um, Pat Gindelsberger uh, had been my secretary for 20 years mm -hmm. or so. So she came out with me, and, and the two of us leased the uh, second floor, the whole floor. And um, the building was really in bad shape. Very bad uh, shape. Uh, it pipes were frozen and the plaster was coming off and but we it was a beautiful building and really had a lot of character to it and i think there was five walnut paneled offices on that floor <coughs> so um, um we took our office out and then subleased the rest of it for mm -hmm. oh i don't know probably seven or eight years. Now, did you sublet it to the city of Wadsworth when they were building the new city hall? No, because they rented the top floor. Oh, you were on the second floor. Right. Okay. And the top floor is what they rented. Right. Who are some of the other people who sublet from you there? Hmm. Um, well, we had uh, an accountant, Harold Davis from Ripman. Um, 
um, Kish uh, had um, Fasco was uh, and um, oh, let's see, we had um, most of them were small. In fact, we had set it up that way intentionally because when we took on this project, we could see a need for one man office, manufacturers, reps, uh, uh, contractors. And Not a, a uh, heavy major, traffic right, kind right, of a thing, right, You're just more right. or less uh, professional then, people. And then Pat had a secretarial service there with telephone answering and, mm -hmm. and typing and so forth that she could do on her own because I didn't keep her that busy. Right. You're somewhat in some retirement though. At right. the present time. But are you still working? Right. And what kinds of things are you doing now? Are um, there are some interesting things that you have your finger in? What are they? Uh, well, uh, uh, when I, and this was, let's see, maybe seven, eight years ago, I decided to uh, slow it out or, and, uh, but I really didn't want to quit altogether. I mean, I, I enjoy what I'm doing, and, you know, well. and there was no point in just staying home. So I was doing small projects that I could do by myself, and people were in a big hurry for it. And there really is a, a need in the architectural profession for that type of work. Of course there are, because you know, uh, not everyone has a, a huge expanse to design, and mm -hmm. they have to have a lot of intimacy there. We're going to come back to that in a minute, but how about telling us now about your own personal family? You and your wife have? We have two daughters. Uh, uh, Linda is the oldest, and she's a pharmacist, and uh, uh, right now is working in a pharmacy over uh, in one of the medical buildings at City Hospital, mm -hmm. <coughs> and their primarily clientele are, uh, is SUMA uh, employees. And uh, the other, the younger daughter is a chiropractor in Cleveland, Tennessee. A chiropractor. Right. That's, uh, so we have kind of a two opposites, right. you know. Both uh, in the medical profession. Right. Yeah. Your dad was a dentist, <laughs> right. then your daughter is a pharmacist, and you're... And your other daughter as a, as, a, and as a chiropractor. What about your wife? Well, of course, she's been in music. Um, is she doing anything at all now? Well, she, after she retired from teaching, um, she taught piano at home there. And that's kind of phased out now. And, but she's involved in hammer dulcimers. And hammer dulcimers. Tell us about the hammer dulcimers and, and the exciting um, uh, revival of this musical instrument. Well, it's, it's, uh, the dulcimer goes clear back to biblical times right. in, in most of European countries have some form of it. The symbol, uh, the, yeah, symbol in the... Symbol in Hungary. Hungary. That's Hungary. Right. And, uh, but uh, she found... Uh, uh, some people in the area that were interested in it and played it. Uh, Martha Zollinger from Ritman of the Gravel Bank people. Mm -hmm. And a nurse from uh, uh, Children's Hospital and another fellow who plays a 12-string guitar. And they get together every Thursday night in our living room and play and then they play around for open houses and they played for a couple weddings and now does your wife a, have a dulcimer oh yes and tell us what it's like well it's a it's a stringed instrument um, it's probably um, 30 inches or three feet at the base and is a um, I don't know and it has uh, uh, two bridges on in it and they play on both sides of the bridge <clears throat> and there's, uh, there's two different sizes there's 11 12 string in a um, 
I think, a 15 string. And they're, they're with little malice Yeah, and felt. they play with, with uh, hammers, and that's why they call it a hammer dulcimer. Made, made out of felt. Well, they're wood. Are they wood? Yeah, and uh, some of them have leather on one edge and wood on the other. You get a little different tone. Different tone. From. Now these, um, uh, there, are no, there are no keys. No. They have to know which one of those right. sets of strings they have to hit. Right. And that makes a particular sound. Right. Now we have your wife on hammer dulcimer. We have the one fellow who's on a 12 string guitar, which right. is a different right. kind of a guitar right. altogether. And then we have the other person who is a... Well, there's, there's uh, uh, two, well, why three hammer dulcimers. Oh, three of them on our hammer right, right, and then right, they have the right, other one who's on right, the 12-string right, guitar. Right. Um, what kind of music do they play? All kinds. Uh, uh, depending on the occasion, they play, you know, like nursing homes, um, but they play folk music, um, Irish, uh, patriotic, mm -hmm. uh, religious, uh, and... Uh, the name of their group is just for fun. Just for fun. Right, and that's, you know, that's they, they do, uh, and that's what, you know, they're not trying to be professional. They, they do play around a lot, and especially this time of year. Now, do you become involved at all with the music? <laughs> no, no, I go out to my shop and... Uh, <laughs> you go out to your shop. Now, I'm glad that you mentioned about your shop because you have a hobby, which is extraordinary. What is that hobby, uh, Ken? Well, I got involved in wood carving probably 25 years ago, and uh, have been quite active in it ever since. Uh, you did more than just become active in it. What did you do in terms of teaching? Well, um, another fellow from Barber and I started a wood carving club here in, in Wadsworth, and we had probably 30 people that kind of came out of not out of work. Wood work. work, you're right. <laughs> Who was the fellow from Barberton? What was his name? I can't remember his name. Okay. He's moved out of the state. But uh, uh, we had both gone to a club meeting down in Canton. And uh, like so many organizations, they get so involved in paperwork of minutes course. and committee yes, reports yes, right. and financial. So we said, we're not going to have any of that. Um, uh, I passed an envelope around. I said, I want everybody to put a dollar in this, and that's going to pay for notices for the next meeting. And when the envelope is dry, I'm going to come around for some more. That's a good way of doing it. And I said, if you don't trust me, I'm not going to keep track of where every dime went and uh, who paid. I kept track of who paid, because then we set up a, a dues thing of a couple dollars a year. And that's the way it ran for many years. And everybody was happy. <coughs> and, uh, but then I've taught several classes in beginning and intermediate wood carving down at Wayne College in, in Orville, plus uh, numerable people. I probably have taught Hundreds of people. Hundreds of people wood carving. What is the main wood that you use for wood carving? Uh, basswood. Now, where do you get the basswood? Basswood is a native wood. It's not a commercial wood, but it's clear grain. It grows around here, um, Ohio, Michigan, and probably is the most popular of, of the woods. Now. And the reason for that is fairly soft. Soft right? and easy, easy clear grain. And clear grain. And uh, what kinds of things do you carve? Most people carve ducks. Now, what you, besides ducks, would you carve? Well, I've never really specialized. I've is a hobby. I like to do different things. I do figures, birds, um, relief carving, um, chip carving, um, animals. Um, and I've done several de decorative decoys. Do you sell them? Oh, occasionally. Occasionally sell them. And there are people who enjoy those kinds of things. Do you have to paint these now? Yes. And uh, uh, some of them. I uh, the birds and ducks don't mean much if they aren't painted because you don't can't tell one bird from another. <laughs> That's true. What about the uh, the painting itself? Is that in itself? That is an art? Uh, right. 
Now, as an architect, you have quite a bit of artistic skills, correct? Well, I don't know. I wish I had more, but... Well, we all want <laughs> right, more right. than we have, but uh, you do have the artistic right. skills. Do you do the painting yourself, or does somebody else do that? No, I do it, and I'm still learning. Uh, started out in acrylics, and then I've gone to oils, and now I'm using a, uh, a watercolor thing that I learned in Europe. Um, a few couple of years ago, I went to a wood carving school in Austria in uh, the mountains over there. It and was they really do a lot of wood carving. They do, and this was a full-time wood carving school, although they had weekly classes in, in um, English and German and French. And uh, that was a real neat experience. But they have a, they use all natural materials like their paints, uh, their glues are all, and, and they don't use any synthetic lacquers or varnishes or... Nothing at all. No, it's all uh, natural. Right. right. Yeah, and I was intrigued with that, and so I've, I'm working on that. And some, some. What about the, um, the students? Have you had any students who have become a, a professional in this area? Well, yes. We... Uh, I have one student, and I really don't know where he is now. <clears throat> He's from Barberton. And when they had the old, uh, um, uh, we used to be carousel of class, but it was down in the senior building across right. from City Hall. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it was a hospital auxiliary had a craft That's show. That's correct, yes. <clears throat> and our club would rent a table. And this fellow was in high school, and he brought some very crude carvings in. But he could see that he could sell them. And so that kept his interest. <coughs> Excuse me. But he went on to do bird carving and went and became uh, quite well, won some nationally uh, awards and award foundation. And now, um, <coughs> do you have the names of any of the people who were in the club and, you know, kind of mainstays? Yeah. Um, um, Wilbur Zuber <coughs> out here. Um, 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 Leonard Fraze. <coughs> mm -hmm. Leonard Fraze from Dirty Drive. Um, Ray Allen. Ray. Uh, How about Jerry Logadice, who does a lot of uh, no, carving? No, there are some that never join our group. They, they Jerry join group. and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Zitto. Uh, Zitto. Mm -hmm. um, or Tom Baldwin. Um, and they're out, uh, they're very, very good carvers. Right, uh, right. Do, uh, Jerry does ducks and uh, does a beautiful job. Dr. Zitto does just about anything. Right. He does miniatures <clears> more than anything else. He's very good at that. Another question that we have regarding your hobby uh, is one that uh, you might find somewhat difficult to answer. Um, did the hobby really come from architect architecture, because you know that's the kind of mind you have, or did it come because of architecture that you had to have an outlet beyond drawing something that... No, uh, I have always been a person who liked to make things. From mm -hmm. the time I was in grade school, I made model airplanes and liked to work with my hands. <clears throat> my wife gave me a Dremel tool, which right. is a little motor. A little motorized tool, right, to tool. do little things. Uh, and I had jars of dental burrs that my dad had thrown away or ceased to use, and I found the two of them cut wood really neat. And it was a beautiful job. <clears throat> so that's kind of how I got started. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Kenny, one of the things that um, you will leave as a legacy are these buildings. They will last for many, many years. And when the buildings themselves are gone, maybe 100, 200, 300 years from now, regardless or depending upon how, they la how long they last, you will always be remembered as having built right. so many of them and having designed so many of them. And then... Probably all of those students that you've had, and you're talking in the hundreds, their <coughs> progeny will always remember you this way as well. 
You've given us a lot of history. You've given us a lot to history. And we are grateful for your opportunity, for the opportunity to interview you today because, Kenny Durer, this is probably your legacy, where you're sitting right now because this is the one room that you right, built, right. one of the rooms that you designed, and the school that you helped design. Thank you very much for joining us today. Unfortunately, our time is up.